one of the legacy aspects of the games was a chance for us to look, get a glimpse of what the city could look like 10, 20, 30 years out in the future if these trend lines continue, if walking, cycling, and transit continues to grow and, and car use continues to drop. And what would the city look like? Well, we, we did the uh, games. Is the screen on page? Should we try to yeah, take that one line out? Or? We could. We lose your video. But oh, okay. That, that. Well, that's probably okay. But. <laughs> no, it's um, awesome. We want to see it. Anyway, so, so I mean, the, so the transportation system during the games was a very different transportation system than it is on a normal. This is the Camden Bridge. Camden Bridge, buses and pedestrians, some cyclists, and that was it, no cars. So, so we went into the games. We developed the transportation, the Olympic transportation plan with the mindset there was a chance to be, do a bit of an experiment, getting take to see what the city would look like and see what people would think of it and if they liked it. Um, I'll just show one sort of detailed graph. One, one of the things, I mentioned the trans, I'll show you another trend. For a special event, the Olympics were the biggest special event we ever hosted. And, and we looked at some other special events. And one of the things we saw was for Canucks games. The Canucks game back in 96 versus the Canucks game in 2007. We saw the trend changing with less people driving, 63% driving down to 56%. We saw that as so over time, less people were driving to events, more people were walking, cycling, and taking transit for an event, both at the GM place. As, as the event venue got bigger, so this was a Rolling Stones concert, so this is 20,000 people, this was a Rolling Stones concert, 50,000 people again. Less people drove, and we get the fireworks celebration of like a couple hundred thousand people. Less people drove again. So you know we're we're guessing a little bit as we're doing the Olympics, but we said okay, well the games is even bigger than that. So we started to project what we could expect in terms of reducing the number of cars and increasing increasing transit use. Not quite a direct line, but anyway. So that was our that was our. A wild leap of faith that as we hosted the biggest event we've ever hosted in the world, I mean, in Canada actually, um, that we would continue to see decreasing car use and increasing transit use, increasing walking and cycling, and we could make it work. So we did that. With, we, we assumed a 40% increase in trips. Sorry about that. We assumed a 40% increase in trips. The 30%. We actually had a 44% increase in trips. And I'll just quickly skip through this, but, but walking, cycling, and transit more than double during the games. And so um, one of our goals in terms of uh, um, for 2020, our goal is to have more than half of our trips in walking, cycling, and transit. And during the games, we saw that we actually had 61% of our trips uh, by walking, cycling, and transit. So it shows that the city, the city can function. Clearly, it was a special event. Clearly, it was kind of a bit of a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, but the feedback that we've had is really, really positive. And that's a bit of a different presentation around you know, more animated streets, more street lighting, and parties, and block closures, and block parties, and all of those types of things. So, so anyways, we're, con we're confident, we believe, that we can, we can continue on this, this trend line, continue to grow walking cycling, and transit, continue to either keep car trips the same or reduce, and, and have a, uh, a better city. So with that set up, how do we grow cycling trips? Uh, so that's now the imperative, is how do we need to grow cycling trips? How do we do that? So one of the things is, is when, we're, when we're talking to the public, um, we can talk about saving the planet, reducing greenhouse gases, that's important. We can talk about having more local communities. But the most effective strategy in dealing with individuals is talking what's in it for them. And well, what's in it for people is, is uh, there's personal benefits in terms of public health. I'll show it to you. I mean, cycling for half an hour a day increases your mean life expectancy. What does a half an hour look like? If you work in the downtown, you know, it's both ways, sort of for two and a half. Well, maybe you just cycle one way and take transit back and watch it. So, those are, so cycle half an hour a day and you'll live longer. Uh, there's a whole number of, of studies in terms of cycling to work reduces mortality of 39%. Um, cycling, if cycling participation doubles, the risk of injury falls by a third. And so the more cyclists, a lot of this is intuitive, um, the more cyclists you have, um, the safer it is. So that's, that's one of the messages we want to get out of this, that it's, it's good from a public health perspective, it's good, it improves your quality of life, and it increases your, your life expectancy. So that's part of how we expect to grow, um, to grow cycling is to, um, you know, communications, 
program and dialogue uh, talking about what's in it for Vancouver citizens. The other thing is understanding um, cyclists, and this is some work that Portland did, and, and they surveyed their population and, and uh, they found a third of the people that said, no way, no how, we're never going to ride our bike, and that's okay. That's okay. The objective here is never to say everybody has to do anything. Um, so, but it's understanding that about a third of the population has no interest, and that's fine. Over here, we've got about one percent that are strong and fearless, and about seven percent that are enthused and confident. And so, I heard some discussion earlier before we started talking about cyclist behavior and, and aggressive um, cyclists. And a lot of those cyclists fit in this category. This group over here, the one percent or the seven percent, um, predominantly male. Um, a lot of testosterone, a lot of spandex, and, and, and in reality, you don't have to build anything for them. You know, they're confident, they can see them moving through traffic in town. And, um, but if we want to grow cycling, we're about 4% now in terms of our cycling motor share. There's about 8% here. But if we want to grow um, you know, into the 10% or, or beyond 20%, you know, Copenhagen is at 36% cycling. Um, if we want to grow, then we need, our target market is here. Our target market is interested but concerned, 60%. And so we need to build facilities and we need to build programs that reach our target market. And, and what does that target market look like? There's our children, there's seniors. Um, the target market has more women um, than most of this, uh, this group here to the right. And so we need to build programs and facilities that meet the needs of the 60% who are interested in riding the bike, they haven't for a long time, but they're interested, or maybe occasionally now they ride you know, on a separated trail you know, around the seawall. They're interested, but they're concerned and not willing um, to ride next to cars and traffic downtown. So that was, that was a study that was done in Portland. Um, also, UBC has done some work, um, cycling and city survey of Metro Vancouver, and they asked uh, people in Vancouver what what types of facilities uh, they would like to see. And a separated bikeway with a physical separation between the cars and the cyclists was the preferred number one choice for cycling on roads. And so, so we know about the makeup and we know what our target market is and we know in particular what their first choice is for facilities. So we know also that separated facilities, again, separation, whether it's paint or physical separation, it's not, it's not just a line, it's not just a, a bike lane, it's, it's more separation than that. Um, we know that that um, contributes to uh, more people cycling to feel safer. Um, and it's best practice, we see it in cities all over the world. And so while the separated lanes downtown were new for Vancouver, they certainly were in the world, Copenhagen, Montreal, New York, Portland, um, cities all over are uh, installing separated bike lanes. Why? Because they work in attracting new cyclists. So this is an inventory of what we have in our system um, as of a few years ago. So there's about 400 lane kilometers of bike ways throughout the city. Um, we've got the seawalls, essentially, are off-street paths, so a path through a park or the seawall um, around the waterfront, um, making up this, this amount. Local street bikeways, you know, like 10th Avenue, Ontario, um, mixed with cars, make up a vast majority. We've got bike lanes on the arterial um, streets, so you can see bike lanes uh, on what Barrage has in downtown. And, um, Marked shared lanes, that's where we don't have enough room to paint in the bike lane, but we put some share to show the bikes and cars are sharing the space. And, and that, little, that little black line there is a separate bike lane, so we just started. We had a couple of small segments on the city. So, so what that tells us is we've got 400 lane kilometers of bike facilities in the city, which is great, but they're not geared to where only this portion here is geared towards our target market, the 60%. So we need to dramatically rethink the type of facilities we're building if we want to actually attract cyclists from the target market. And so that's the thinking that led into the um, separated bike lane trial project. And so, um, so it's, a, it's a fundamental shift 
in the way we think of those and plan for cycling in the city. And, uh, and we've implemented it by doing a trial. It is a trial. Um, I'll touch on a few of the, the criticisms or uh, um, you know, hot button issues. Um, by so uh, it's a trial. And, and the timing is such that we're, we're up, we just started an update of our 97 transportation plan in the last couple of weeks. And over the next year and a bit, we'll be updating our overall transportation plan. So the separated bike lane trial will give us information that we can feed back in to the new transportation plan. So we've got a lot of ideas and sort of explain the rationale. Um, but